ready to go. All right. So we can get started with the afternoon lecture. He's taught us topological field theory. He's co-taught us square dancing. Now he's going to teach us differential cohomology. That's correct. <laughs> can you hear me? Can you hear me OK? Yes? Uh-oh. I'm doing a so-so. Is that better? that better? Thanks. All right. So um, as Oliver mentioned, we're going to put aside topological field theory for a moment for a lecture or two. And then I am legally obligated to tell you about uh, differential cohomology. So that's what we're going to do. Um, and we're going to begin. with uh, Maxwell theory in uh, three plus one dimensional Minkowski space. Didn't we hear about that this morning? Um, uh, there's going to be some non-trivial overlap with Thomas's lectures. I hope it will lead to constructive interference <laughs> rather than the other way around. <laughs> Um, but the paths will diverge, I promise. So, um, so in particular, um, Thomas started out with a U1 connection. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just start with a classical field strength. So one connection comes later for me. I've got a classical field strength, which is a globally defined two-form on, on Minkowski space. So in general, when I write omega, Upper two of some manifold, it means globally defined whatever form on that manifold. I'm going to try and be careful only to write globally defined forms. Okay, I'm not going to write a form and then say and then and back up and say, oh, but it was not really globally defined. Um, so now, if we have a space-time splitting, then we can define uh, f and we can decompose f in terms of its magnetic and electric parts. That would be the uh, B field, dxj, dxk. And the uh, space-time component is the traditional electric field. And then half of Maxwell's equations are df equals 0. And I hope you've all done this. But if you've never done this, uh, this is a really important exercise. Uh, show that this is equivalent to del dot b equals 0 and uh, db by dx by time plus del cross e equals zero. Now to write the other Maxwell equation, we're going to need a Hodge star. So I'm going to make a little digression here on Hodge star so that we're all on the same page. So let's let Take a n-dimensional manifold with a metric. And by metric, I mean any um, section of SIM2 of the cotangent bundle, which is non-degenerate. So I'm not committing myself to a signature yet. When I signed up for TASI, they said, uh, do you? Uh, um, we need your signature. And I said, no. <laughs> um, so, so we're going to assume that MN is oriented. And that means for us that we uh, choose a nowhere zero volume form. So there's a canonical form, once you've chosen an orientation, which in local coordinates looks like the absolute value of the determinant g mu nu times dx1 through n. Hope that notation is clear to everybody. I mean dx1 wedge dot 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 dxn. And that's with respect to an oriented basis for the cotangent bundle. And so then the Hodge star is defined pointwise as an operator from the else anti-symmetric product, TP 
m to lambda n minus l tpm, and therefore induces a linear map from l forms to n minus l forms. And the way you do it is you define a local inner product on these uh, exterior uh, product spaces. So if in local coordinates, alpha looks like 1 over L factorial, uh, alpha mu 1 through mu L, dx mu 1 through mu L, then the local inner product of alpha and beta at P is 1 over L factorial, g mu 1 nu 1, g mu L nu L, alpha mu 1 through mu L, beta mu 1 through mu L. And now we can define Hodge star, uh, alpha wedge star beta is equal to the local inner product, this is at a point, the local inner product times the volume form. And that's the way I like to think about the Hodge star. It's nice and clean, no epsilon symbols. Um, and in the notes I put about seven exercises to get you used to working with Hodge star so it never strikes fear into your heart. And um, one exercise we're going to use a lot today, so let me just mention it, which is I take Hodge star squared from omega L to omega L, um, and that acts as a scalar operator. It's just multiplication, in fact, just multiplication by a sign. So this is multiplication by what sign? Minus 1 to the L n minus L times the sign of the determinant of g mu nu. This is any signature. Uh, the other example, uh, the other exercise we're going to use is uh, supposing we take uh, 1 plus 1 dimensional Minkowski space. So we choose our Minkowski metric to be minus dx naught squared plus dx1 squared. And we choose our orientation to be dx1 wedge dx naught. Then the Hodge star of dx plus and minus, these are light cone coordinates, x naught plus and minus x1, is uh, equal to plus and minus dx plus minus. Okay, so that's Hodge star. So then the other half of Maxwell's equations is then uh, d of star f equals zero. And another exercise is work it out. This is del dot e equals zero. And uh, dE by dx naught uh, minus del cross b equals zero. So now, that's Maxwell. So now I want to define what I'll call generalized classical Maxwell theory, which means we consider these equations of motion. We're just defining the theory at this point by its equations of motion. We define the equations of motion on arbitrary manifolds. with some um, non-degenerate metric, any signature. And f is an L form, globally defined L form, of any L. And then <coughs> all we say is that the equations of motion are df equals 0 and d of star f equals 0. Now, the one thing you, you notice automatically here is that we automatically have, because Hodge, Hodge squared is just multiplication by a non-zero scalar, uh, we automatically have um, classical electromagnetic duality. And Thomas talked about a quantum version of uh, abelian duality. Here I'm still talking about the classical theory. So if we tilde equals star f, then 
F tilde, of course, satisfies the same pair of equations with uh, L replaced by N minus L. So now let's look at something about the uh, solutions of the equations of motion. So if we're on n-dimensional Minkowski space, then a natural ansatz is to take some constant p-form to e to the ik dot x, and the equations imply that k squared equals zero, uh, and other things having to do with p and the relation of p and k, which we won't need. Uh, mostly we'll be thinking actually about Euclidean space. Now with Euclidean signature and mn compact, in which case the equations of motion imply that f is a harmonic form. So let me take a moment to say something about harmonic forms. So if we consider the Durham complex, so I'll denote that as omega star m, that means the direct sum over k of omega k m, and if I have a complex, I mean that uh, it has a degree one operator d, which squares to zero on it, <coughs> then we can put an inner product on this. which is the integral over mn of alpha wedge star beta. You know, um, Oliver, I was looking for the other kind of chalk. I'm actually a little bit... Oh, you prefer the... I'm actually a little allergic to the Hajimoto. Um, I thought I would get away with it, but I'm already starting to cough. And it's not COVID. I'm just... Uh, oh, great. Excellent. Thank you very much. Perfect. I'm going, to, I'm going to need about 14 of those. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, so then um, the Hodge theorem says that omega k of m is an orthogonal, with respect to this inner product, an orthogonal decomposition of the harmonic forms plus the image of D, plus the image of D dagger. What's D dagger? Well, D we know, D goes from, is the exterior derivative, having defined a non-degenerate inner product, a non-degenerate inner product, we have D dagger goes from omega k plus one to omega k. And you can work out a formula for D dagger. It's plus or minus, the sign depends on k, uh, star D star. The harmonic forms are neither in the image of D or D dagger. The harmonic forms are the set of forms alpha such that D alpha equals zero and D dagger alpha equals zero, which is another form of our generalized Maxwell equations. Oh yeah, one other math thing I want to say is there's a theorem, which is that if M is compact, then, and uh, now I'm talking about Euclidean signature, then HK of M is a finite dimensional uh, vector space. I should have said that I'm working over the real numbers. When I write omega of M, I'm talking about real fields. So now I want to make two side remarks. Uh, the first remark is that we can connect to Ken, something Ken and Trilligator was talking about. So uh, Ken was talking about superquantum mechanics, which is an n equals 1 in the language of my first lecture, an n equals 1 field theory, where the, uh, the bosonic maps are maps from the one-dimensional manifold of time to, let's say, a target space, which I'm going to take to be this, this uh, Euclidean manifold. In this case, as I explained to you, being a one-dimensional field theory, all we need to know is the Hilbert space associated to a point. And the Hilbert space a point associated to a point is exactly this Durham complex 
tensors with the complex numbers, because we're doing uh, quantum mechanics, with an L2 completion. Supersymmetry operators are D and D dagger. And the vector space of supersymmetric ground states is exactly the space of harmonic forms. So, same math, different physics, because we are going to be considering MN as the space-time on which uh, physics is taking place, and we're going to be doing dynamics of fields on space-time. But it's, an, it's nice to connect with what Ken said. The other remark is that we can uh, also generalize. There's an important generalization of generalized Maxwell theory, generalized classical Maxwell theory, called uh, the theory of the self-dual or the anti-self-dual field. So let's notice that if n is an even number, say twice l, then the Hodge star goes from omega l to omega l, and the Hodge star squares to minus 1 to the l times the sine of the determinant of g mu nu. So that implies that if we have one of these field strengths, then we could impose the self-duality condition. That's the self-duality condition. Or we could impose the anti-self-duality condition. That's consistent so long as star squares to 1. So consistency means that n should be equal to 0 mod 4 in Euclidean signature, and n should be 2 mod 4 in Lorentzian signature. So then the classical theory of the self-dual or anti-self-dual, let's check for definite, let's, let's take self-dual. The classical theory of the self-dual theory is the pair of equations f equals star f and df equals 0. That's it. That's the classical theory. So just to get a, a feeling for what this is saying, let's go back to uh, 1 plus 1 dimensional Minkowski space. And if f equals plus or minus star f, that implies by this exercise over here, that implies that f is some function, let's call it phi, of time and space times dx plus or minus. And then the equation df equals 0 becomes an equation of motion for phi. It says that d minus or plus of phi equals 0. So the theory of the 1 plus 1 dimensional self-dual field is the theory of a chiral scalar field. And higher dimensional self-dual or anti-self-dual fields are generalizations of the theory of a chiral scalar field. All righty. Let's see. I'm missing a board. Okie okay, dokie. Okay. Now, I've started, I've introduced these theories by their equations of motion. It's natural to ask even the classical theory, what about an action principle? Well, interestingly, to write an action principle, we must break, manifest, electromagnetic duality. OK, so we have to prefer an F over an F tilde. OK, so I'll, uh, let's take, uh, so if F was in omega L, I'm going to prefer F, and I'm going to solve DF equals 0 locally. F is equal to DA 
say, on some contractible neighborhood. In general, in these theories, because my f I'm just assuming is some L form, closed L form, in general, I cannot write f equals dA globally. And what's the obstruction? The global obstruction. is the uh, Durham cohomology of M, which I remind you is the kernel of D from omega L to omega L minus uh, L plus 1, divided by the image of D from omega L minus 1 to omega L. That's a subspace. The image is a subspace of the kernel because D squared is equal to 0. And um, we, uh, the, this, is, this is measuring the obstructions. So fix a cohomology class in the elf Durham cohomology of M. And choose, your choice, choose a representative F0 whose cohomology class is little h then every um, F with that cohomology class is related to F0 by dA, where A is in omega L minus 1 of M is globally well-defined. So now we can write an action principle. We write, if you like, a different action principle for each Durham cohomology class, H. And it's an action principle for a fixed A, and it's just equal to lambda F wedge star F, the action that Thomas started out with. And now what is the, um, the variation, the stationarity condition that implies the other Maxwell equation? We already started out by imposing the first one. So there's something called the Hodge theorem another Hodge theorem, which says that if you look at this action, so now what are you doing? This is an action on the set of representatives of a given cohomology class, and it says that on a compact Euclidean manifold, there exists a unique minimum of the action. And that defines, that defines a harmonic form. And that's the proof that the Delft Elf Durham cohomology is isomorphic to the space of harmonic forms. Now, one nice thing that this uh, coupling to gravity gives you. Hmm? So when you said we must break EM duality, uh, I certainly don't know of an example that has EM duality manifest, but is there some fundamental obstruction to having an action principle which, which preserves EM duality manifest? Oh, that's a great question. Um, that's also a very complicated question. I'm going to address that. Uh, oh, should I, thank you. Um, the question, the question, which is a very good question, is: Is there any fundamental principle that obstructs us to writing a manifestly electromagnetic dual action? So you have to be. You see, you're going to rapidly get into trouble. You might try and writing something with uh, uh, f wedge star f plus f tilde wedge star f tilde, and then try and enforce some kind of Lagrange multiplier that makes f uh, tilde equal star f. And you'll typically get some unwanted extra degrees of freedom. So I'm going to come back, I'm going to come back to your point in a slightly different um, version when I make a few remarks about the action for the self-dual field. Yeah. Question? When you say that the required obstruction is in the drum cohomology, mm -hmm. are we assuming there is no torsion? Um, this is a real vector space. There's no torsion. I mean, the, uh, if we look at the, the singular cohomology with the integer group. Uh, that's right. So the singular cohomology 
So the question is, are, am I assuming there's no torsion? And no, I have made no assumption about torsion or not in the singular cohomology group. I'm talking about real vector spaces here with no, no, no uh, torsion at all. Now, what you're really asking about is what is the relationship of this to the finitely generated abelian group, which is the singular cohomology group over the integers? I will come to that. That's the question. Say that there exists this fact that there exists a unit minimum. Yeah. Or is your view the isomorphism? But it, it, I only see one view on the corresponding, but uh, like how do you show that the linearity structure on both the strengths are How do I show what? Like uh, they are isomorphic as the linear vector spaces. Oh, but that's because, yeah, because the question is um, I showed those, I, but I didn't really show anything. I, I claimed that there exists a unique <coughs> minimum. Um, and I just remarked that if you can prove that there exists a unique minimum, then that gives you a one-to-one -one correspondence between Durham and um, Durham and the harmonic forms. Uh, the question then is, well, how do I know that that's a linear isomorphism of vector spaces? And that just comes from um, that just comes from linearity of Maxwell's equations. You see, if I take an H1 plus H2, I could take an F0 one plus F0 two and I'm going to get the, the direct sum of the minimum because it's unique. OK, so one little benefit here. This is really just a side remark. Maybe I shouldn't even waste time on it. But one little benefit, I'm going to put it, squeeze it in over here. One little benefit of this is that when, you, when I write a, an action like this, I've told you what this coupling is to gravity. And that implies that we have an energy momentum tensor associated to F, which is some sec section of the a symmetric square of T dual M. And now a little exercise for you is to show that if V is a tangent vector at some point P, then lambda inverse um, TF of V at that point P is the contraction V with F, contraction V with F, minus one half contraction of V with V, contraction of F with F. And the other part of the exercise, this is harder, is to show that TF is actually exactly the same as TF dual. So even though the actions don't, um, I've broken manifest electric mag magnetic duality, I still do have electric magnetic duality when it comes to physical uh, qu quantities like energy density and momentum. Now, I was asked about uh, manifest duality. And uh, one version of that is, um, is there an action principle for the self-dual field? That's a very complicated question. So I, I wrote down the equations of motion for the self-dual field. Uh, let's consider Lorentzian signature. So that means n is equal to 2 mod 4, and that implies that L is 1 mod 2, and that implies that the most obvious action, this one, is equal to F wedge F, but F is an odd degree form, so that's 0. So sad. OK, so, um, and similarly, it will fail in Euclidean signature. Uh, now, many people then conclude that um, there is therefore no Lorentz invariant um, uh, action for the self-dual field. In my opinion, that is not true. Uh, but it is a very complicated story. There are many papers out there uh, taking many different points of view, writing action principles there for the self-dual field. In fact, there's not one. There are many. But it's a more complicated story. You have to start introducing some more data, uh, something like a Lagrangian decomposition of the space uh, omega L. That's what I did with Bielov, but then there are other people who did different things. However, there is a hypothetical quantum theory of a non-abelian self-dual field. The current folklore is that nobody knows how to write fundamental fields that describe the quantum self-dual self, uh, quantum self-dual non-abelian field. 
and certainly nobody knows how to write an action principle. That is the current folklore. Okay? It might be over, to, I don't know of any rigorous theorems, but, uh, and there are many, many papers out there that try to write such an action. Uh, the ones that I've studied, I've always been a little disappointed because they cheat at some point. There might be a paper out there and some very frustrated person who's actually solved it and no one's listening. I don't know. Um, but um, I would remark that, there, you know, if I gave this, this talk 20 years ago, I probably would have said the same thing about the uh, non-abelian M2 brain. And uh, then along came the ABJM description. So, um, you know, uh, folklore can be overturned. Okay. So, oh yeah, the other, the other remark uh, is that um, at this point, if I, put no, if I put no constraints on the periods of F, Thomas made this remark too, uh, without constraints, On the periods of f, lambda is meaningless. I could just absorb it. But if I put a constraint on the periods of f, that they be, for example, um, that, that they be quantized, then lambda becomes meaningful and becomes something like the radius squared of a, a, chiral, of a scalar field or um, the electric coupling squared. All right, so now let's talk about, very, very briefly, about electric and magnetic currents. So, so far we've been talking about the vacuum Maxwell equations. So, now at the risk of confusing everybody no end, I'm going to write Jm as a magnetic current, which is a globally defined L plus 1 form, and Je is... It's electromagnetic dual, like exchange L for N minus L. And these are not the JE and the JM uh, in Thomas's talk. These are just external uh, electric and magnetic sources. And then we generalize the Maxwell equations to Maxwell equations with sources this way. Let me make a few remarks about this. It automatically follows from these equations that Jm is dJe is zero. That's the current conservation. It also f follows that if Jm is not zero, then F is not dA at all, even locally, at least not where the support of Jm is. That means that if you like to go on and think about Maxwell theory in terms of a connection on a U1 line bundle, you're sunk. You can't do it you're going to have to start talking about gerbs. Okay, the other remark is um, if F and F at star, if F is, is smooth, then the cohomology classes of M and JE are zero, which might confuse you. You might say, wait a second, I thought somehow the cohomology classes of these currents just have something to do with the charge. They do, but the charge is measured in a relative cohomology group. That's explained in the notes that I don't want to take too much time to talk about. So if you're intrigued by that remark, see the notes. I'm going to rush on now to brains. <laughs> Oh, come on. Do I have to do it now? <laughs> uh, so, sorry. <laughs> so, um, so, 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 uh, P brains in general are extended objects. So, if I have, uh, if I have a space time, n minus 1 times time, then um, the, the p brain is going to have some p-dimensional spatial slice times time, uh, which is sitting in here. And I'm going to call that the world volume of the brain. 
so it's p plus one dimensional. And um, electrically charged brains produce an, a current which looks like this, plus, uh, yeah, W N M N, uh, where eta is a delta function representative of the Poincaré dual of uh, W and M N. Okay, so yeah, I'm not okay. In the notes, I compute how you know how, what's the relationship between the the p of the electrically charged p brain and the l. I'm not going to take time to do that. I really need to rush on to other things. Uh, the magnetically charged brains would look like this. Um, and there's a story there. So we could study we could study the uh, solutions of these generalized Maxwell equations, or you know, these generalized Maxwell fields occur naturally in supergravity theories. And so we could soup this up a bit and, uh, and think about these kinds of sources in a supergravity theory, and then write down uh, soliton solutions in supergravity for these brains. Uh, for these brains. Now, these soliton solutions have collective coordinates. And I'm not sure if this is the first, but it's certainly one of the first. So um, Callan, Harvey, and Strominger studied uh, five brains in 10-dimensional string theories, heterotic and type 2a and 2b. And, um, you know, they, dis they, they noticed that um, the soliton solutions, we should think of them as objects with degrees of freedom propagating on the brain world volume. And then Polchitsky made a, an absolutely brilliant paper, wrote an absolutely brilliant paper, where he pointed out that um, these brains in string theory specifically those charged under Ramon Ramon fields, uh, wiggle and move. They're dynamical objects. So they're very different from the defects. You're going to be hearing a lot about defects. Thomas talked about defects. Uh, there's a, the, in this, in this uh, school, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of talk about defects. You should distinguish in your mind brains from defects. The, de the brains are dynamical objects. They wiggle and move. And, um, and so now, very similar to the ADS-CFT correspondence, we could make a, a sort of an important change of viewpoint. We could change our viewpoint from saying that we're putting in, you know, God is putting in some external electric and magnetic sources, and the, mag and the electromagnetic field responds to that. We could instead say, let's study the world volume dynamics of a brain in a specified electromagnetic field. So let's ask about that. And let's start again with, um, with, with Maxwell theory itself, Maxwell F and omega 2 of m specified. Let's study the dynamics of a probe. Sometimes it's called test particle. So if our test particle moving in this n-dimensional space-time is uncharged, then since we're studying the dynamics of this test particle, just the way the brains have dynamics, this is a zero brain after all, then we're going to do the quantum mechanical path integral. Here comes h bar the first time in this talk. Uh, I over h bar t ds 
integrated over the world volume, which is just a line, of that test particle. Now ds is the induced metric on the world line, and tau is some um, proper time parameter. So now we can look at the classical, uh, the stationary points here, and we get the classical equations of motion. Oh, sorry. And T is known as the tension. And in this case, it corresponds just to the mass of the particle. So now we get the, uh, the equation of motion is T dx mu ds equals zero. And that's the geodesic equation. Now, let's give our test particle electric charge. OK, so we're moving in some specified Maxwell field. Well, we all know that we have to have, let's call it QE, we all know that we have to have the Lorentz force modifying our equation of motion. Let's call this star. And let's ask, how are we going to modify this action principle to produce this equation of motion? Well, what we must do is we must change this by some u1 factor that depends on the world line. So what is this u1 factor? It's some map from world lines to u1. If f is dA, where A is globally defined, one form, then i of w1 is equal to the exponential of i over h bar times the integral over w1 of qe a. And now, if you substitute this formula into here and compute the new equations of motion, you'll get the Lorentz force law. So that's the property when f is exact. Now let's look at some key properties of chi. Well, one thing is, supposing I have two particles. So I have W1 disjoint union W1 prime. So I have two particles moving. Well, their actions should add, if they're not interacting, chi of W1 disjoint W1 prime should be the product of chi of W1 times the chi of W1 prime. So that means that if we restrict that it makes sense to consider uh, chi as a group homomorphism from the infinite dimensional abelian group of one cycles on M to U1. The next thing we know is that if W1, the boundary of a two chain, then by Stokes and, again, F is dA, is, where A is globally well defined, then chi of W1 is the exponential of I over H bar times the integral over that two chain of QE F. But now, this gives away 
supplies an extension of chi to to topologically non-trivial uh, background field configurations. What we do is we say that the action principle, the phase there, is some homomorphism from Z1 to U1 which has the property that every time my one cycle is the boundary of a two chain, I can evaluate chi by this formula. Those are the two defining properties of what are called a Cheever-Simons character. So now I'm going to give you the definition a Cheeger Simons character of degree two is an element of HOM of the infinite dimensional group of closed one cycles on our manifold into U1 such that there exists an F in omega 2 of M, the property dot, uh, such that if W is the, is the boundary of a two chain, then we can identify chi of W with this explicit formula over the two chain. Now, maybe for the moment, I should put Cheeger Simons here, because you see I've, I've dropped the H bar and the QM. Um, so, yeah, so this is just a math definition. This knows nothing about H bars and Qs and all of that. So, the statement is that we can extend this action principle to topologically non trivial fields by saying actually what we should do is we should choose a Cheeger Simons character. And now, as you're going to see, and uh, this is one of the main points of what I want to see, as you're going to see, there's a lot more, there's, there's more information, gauge variant information in a Cheeker Simons character than there is in just the field strength. So, the set of all uh, Cheeker Simons characters. is itself an abelian group. It's denoted H2 of M, and it's also known as a differential cohomology group of degree two. So that's differential cohomology in degree two. So now let me make some remarks about it. So, if we have properties A and B, that implies a quantization of the periods of, I'm going to get tired of writing F Cheeger Simons. Let's just write F. Okay, and bear in mind that my motivation, my physics motivation, had my physics F, maybe I'll put this as physics F because I'm going to use that less as I talk more and more about Cheeger-Simons cohomology. 
So it says that the quantization of the periods of f, uh, it, it, sorry, it implies the quantization of the periods of f. And how does that go? Well, supposing I have in my spacetime some closed one cycle, which happens to bound some two chain. Well, it might also bound some other two chain. OK? And then if I take the two chains, the union of the two chains, maybe I'll have to change an orientation on one of them, I'll get a closed two cycle. Now, what, what, is, what does this condition be saying? It says that I can identify chi of sigma 1, w1, as the exponential of i times the integral over b2 of f. But someone else might choose a different chain. And they'll say, no, no. It's the integral over b2 prime of f. Well, if we're going to have a coherent definition, these had better be the same. So because these are the same, that implies that the exponential of i times the integral over sigma 2 of f is 1. Otherwise, otherwise, it doesn't work. And now I could choose any two, co two, co two cycle. I could choose any two cycle. And I could divide it up this way. So any cycle, any two cycle, I could divide up in two and apply this argument. So this implies this must be true for all sigma 2 in Z2 of M. Well, that's the statement that implies that the periods of F are 2 pi times an integer. And so the way I'm going to write this is F is in omega 2 Z prime of M, where z prime is 2 pi times z. And the notation means that f is a two form whose periods are all in z prime. Yes, question. Pardon? Is the Jesus Simon's character literally the Wilson line? Or is it uh, there's no Wilson lines yet because I haven't talked about connections on U1 bundles. Ah, but that, I just said A is a one form. But you're right. yeah. I'm going to be identifying the degree two Trigger Simons characters with Wilson lines. So that is completely correct. I really haven't said that yet. But that's coming. That's coming. Exactly. Um, so it's just a consequence of these that the periods of f are quantized. Now, here's a little remark which you should think about. Really, it's an exercise. If f has quantized periods, then f is closed. Notice I didn't say anything about f being closed. I didn't say that the Maxwell field was uh, on shell, but now we learn that if f has uh, quantized periods, then df equals 0. And so um, I'll call the kernel of d. I'll also denote that sometimes this way. Uh, that's one remark. The other remark is that um, this, I'm sure many of you recognize, is very closely related to Dirac's argument for quantization of magnetic charge. So this is exactly the style, if you consider the quantum mechanics 
if you consider a magnetic monopole at x equals zero, and you consider a charged particle moving in R3 minus zero, so here's the magnetic monopole. If I consider some closed world line of a particle, well, I could enclose with one B2 or another B2, and then we work out that QE QM times F, which will be proportional to the volume sphere, or the volume form on a, on a two sphere. Yeah, that's good enough. A volume form on the two sphere. Uh, this has to be equal to one, and then that quantizes this product. It's the same argument. Okay, so now I, I come to your point. So um, there's a fact which we're going to be able to prove, but I'm just going to state it as a fact in a moment. There's a fact that every L equals 2 Shaker Simons character is the holonomy function for some connection on some principle U1 bundle. So let me write that out. So, fact. And after I say more about Shaker, uh, differential cohomology, you'll be able to prove this fact for yourself. Um, every L equals 2, Cheeker Simon's character is the holonomy function for some principal U1 bundle over M with connection. So, you see, conversely, if I have a principal U1 bundle with connection, then the holonomy of nabla around W can be considered as a map from Z1M into U1. My definition of holonomy is that if the connection is trivial, so it's D plus A for a globally well-defined A, then the holonomy of this delta around W is the exponential of I integral around W of A. But more generally, if the first turn class is not zero, I can't write that globally. I can write it locally. Uh, but then there's still a holonomy function. So we can think of holonomy. Yes? OK. Just set from Z1 of M into U1. What's the question? What's P? P is, a for some, P, a principal U1 bundle over M. If I'm ever using math terms you're not sure about, I'd be happy to define them, too. What's a principal U1 bundle? Okay, sure. Um, let G be a topological group. Like you want. But I'll, I might, if, if you're going to ask this question, then you might as well, we might as well say, what is the principal G bundle? Okay? And then you can apply it to G equals U1. So let G be a, a, a topological group. A G torsor is a set X on which G acts. Um, freely and transitively. That means that if I, I choose some point x naught, then every other point 
is obtained by action with G. But there's no natural origin. So let me, let me illustrate that. Uh, this blackboard that I'm erasing right now, this blackboard that I'm erasing right now, uh, this is R2. No, it's not R2. It's affine two-dimensional space. You see, R2 is special. R2 has an origin. Now, I want you to take that affine two-dimensional space and make it into R2. How are you going to do it? You're going to choose an origin. So everybody in the room, choose an origin. Now, um, could you come up and show me your origin? <laughs> Choose, choose an origin, yeah. Just, just show me. Thank you very much. OK. Was that your origin? No. 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 There is no natural origin here. But having chosen an origin, we now have a vector space. You see, on this blackboard, we have a group action by the group R2. It's by translations. So the group R2 acts by translation along the blackboard. It acts without fixed point. It acts transitively. You see, if the Earth were flat, imagine the flat Earth. <laughs> uh, the flat Earth would be an affine two-dimensional space. It would be a torsor. Where would the origin be? Would it be London, Paris? Boulder? I mean, where would the origin be? There's no natural origin. So that's, what it, that's the idea of a torsor. It's a space on which we have a transitive free action of a group. Now, a, a principal G bundle is a continuous family. of G torsors. So a principal G bundle over M is a continuous family of G torsors over M. So here's M. And for every point P and M, there's some XP, which is a principal, which is a G torsor. But there's no natural origin. So it's most definitely not the same thing as N times G. Because if we had m times g, a group comes with an identity. It comes with a natural origin. And now there's a technical thing that um, near any point, there's a neighborhood u, so that there's a homeomorphism phi from my principal g bundle restricted to, uh, going a little too fast. It's a continuous family of G torsors, so it's a space P with a continuous map P to M. OK, so the inverse image of P is what I called XP there, is a G torsor. And now there is a uh, technical condition that near any P in M, there exists a neighborhood of P such that there's a homeomorphism uh, of pi inverse of U with G. And finally, there has to be a right G action, which is free. And this has to be an equivariant map. So that is too much for you possibly to absorb if you haven't seen this definition before, but now it's written. And the intuitive thing is that you should think of it as a manifold where you have, for a U1 bundle, locally you have copies of U1, but it's like this blackboard. There's no origin of the U1. Okay. Um, that is a principal G bundle. 
Is everybody okay with a connection on a principal G bundle? Yes, don't be afraid to speak up. What's a connection? What's, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, what's a connection? So, so I have this principal G bundle. I, I like to think of it as P sitting over M with some continuous map pi. And a connection is a rule for lifting paths. OK, so this thing locally looks like locally looks like a product of u and u cross g. And so the idea is if down here on m, if I have a path, let's call it gamma, from x0 to x1, then over here I have, this is say u, this is u times g, then over here is the fiber, This is the inverse image of x naught. And if I choose an initial point, let's call it p naught, if I choose an initial point, then I have a lifted path, gamma tilde. So gamma tilde depends on the initial point, and it depends on gamma. That's what a connection is. Well, I need to say one more thing. It needs to be coherent under gluing. So if I have a path gamma 1, and I have another path gamma 2 to x2, and if the end point of this gamma 1, let's call it uh, gamma 1 tilde of 1, is p1, if I choose that as the initial point to lift my path here, so I get uh, p2, that's the same thing as considering the composed path and the lifting of the composed path with initial point p0. So it has to be coherent under gluing. That is the definition of a connection. So when I talked about holonomy, what happens is if we consider closed paths, we're going to lift this path and we're going to come back to some other point. And remember that the fiber of a principal G bundle is a G torsor. So that means that this point must be related to this point by some g action, and that g is the holonomy of that path for that connection. All right. So if we have a principal U1 bundle with connection, then connection nabla, then we have a map holonomy sub delta from Z1 to U1. OK. And, um, This is a Cheeger Simons character. And moreover, what I'm saying up there in that fact is that every L equals 2 Cheeger Simons character is of this form. So the holonomy function. This captures all gauge invariant information of the connection or of the gauge field. It is, it is, it is exquisitely designed, these definitions A and B, they are exquisitely defined to be capturing exactly the gauge invariant information of a gauge field for L equals 2, and only that. And that's a consequence of another theorem, which is very useful, so I'll give it to you in a more generality. Supposing I have a principal G bundle, bundle, uh, with connection. Nabla, then the holonomy is a map from the one cycles on M to the conjugacy classes of G. 
if G is U1, then it's, it's abelian. Uh, then the conjugacy class is the same as the group. Now, if G is compact, and the holonomy of Nabla is the same as the holonomy function of Nabla delta, then the principal, U1, the principal G bundles are isomorphic, and Nabla is isomorphic to Nabla prime. So many of you probably think about A mod G, right? Connections mod gauge transformations. What I'm saying is that a point in A mod G is precisely the same as specifying the holonomy function. OK, so now we have a picture of the degree 2. Four minutes. OK. OK, good. Um, so now we have a picture of the, uh, the second differential cohomology group. And this is a picture that's going to generalize, as I'll explain tomorrow. OK, so h check 2 of m. Well, these are, this is the gauge invariant information of all possible principal U1 bundles with connection. So first of all, the topological class of a principal U1 bundle over M is captured, is, is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the first turn class of P, which is an element of H2 of MZ. Okay, I was asked about torsion before. Here it comes. This is a finitely generated abelian group, and it might well have torsion. Okay, so now we can take H2 check of M, and this is a disjoint union over all X in uh, H2 of MZ of the space of connections on, let's say, P sub X or if you prefer, a disjoint of A mod G for X. Now, what does A mod G for X look like? In general, if A is the space of connections on a principal G bundle over M, this is an affine space. I just told you about affine spaces. This is an affine space for one forms on M with values in what's called the adjoint bundle. But for G equals U1, we can cut to the chase, and it's just an affine space for omega 1 of M, which means that any, in any topological class, I fix an X, fix X, fix X, choose some connection, and then every other connection, some connection nabla naught. Every other connection is delta naught plus alpha, where alpha is a globally well-defined one, one form. What are gauge transformations? If I calculate A mod G, gauge transforms, gauge transformations take alpha, goes to alpha plus omega, where omega lives in omega 1 with periods in C prime. I explained to you before that if I fix the periods, if I quantize the periods, then omega is closed. If omega has non-zero periods, it's called a large gauge transformation. And if omega is d epsilon for some globally well-defined function epsilon, it's called a small gauge transformation. So what is a mod g sub x? This is where I'm finishing, Oliver. In case you're getting antsy. Um, so what is a sub x? a mod g sub x. This is the space of all one forms on M mod one forms with integral periods of M. And now we have our Hodge theorem. This is harmonic one forms, direct sum the image of D, direct sum the image of D dagger. And what are how one forms with integral periods? 
these are harmonic one forms with integral periods, direct sum the image of D. So what is this quotient? This quotient is H1 divided by the lattice of harmonic one forms with integral periods plus the infinite dimensional vector space image of D dagger. And so the conclusion of this talk is that H2 check of M can be written as, yeah, as a connected uh, a product of H2 of MZ, finitely generated abelian group, times a connected torus, which is equal to the, one the harmonic one forms divided by harmonic one forms with integral periods, which is just as a group isomorphic to u1 to the first Betty number, times an infinite dimensional vector space image of D dagger. We will generalize this to other values of L tomorrow. End of lecture. They didn't clap immediately because we're all still writing. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Yeah, so uh, can I take physically these labels here? The, the first label is like the, the amount of magnetic flux going through non trivial cycles, and the second label is like the number of magnetic monopoles. Is this a uh, uh, there is there are, there are physical there are various physical terms I'm going to associate to these, but it's not quite what you said. But you're definitely on the right track. Uh, these I would call um, Wilson lines connected to the identity. Okay, not discrete as opposed to discrete Wilson lines, which is a kind of a confusing term. These are Wilson lines for trivial gauge fields. These are uh, for flat. Excuse me. These are Wilson lines for topologically trivial flat gauge fields. These are, well, this is the first Chern class. This is the topological sector. And these are the oscillator modes of the Maxwell gauge field. The gauge invariant information in the oscillator modes. The one thing I really want to stress here is that everything here is gauge invariant. The Cheeger-Simons group is the group well, I've stressed it right here. It is the group of gauge invariant information. More questions? Yes. Oh, someone over there. I want to double that. Uh, so you said we're generalizing to other L tomorrow. Can right. we also generalize this to other G principal bundles, like Z in? Oh, oh, okay. The question is, can we generalize from U1 to other G? It's a great question. The answer is yes, if G is abelian. The answer is not known if G is non-abelian. That's getting back to the non-abelian theory of higher forms and can that be done. I mean, in the literature all the time, we're replacing U1 by by tori, lattices, you know, abelian groups, but abelian groups. It's very much about abelian groups. Question back there. Ah, nice question, nice question. Can we think about this Cheeger Simons or this differential cohomology group as, uh, as, as the cohomology group of some complex, the, the kernel mod image of some complex? The answer is yes. Um, it follows from the work of Hopkins and Singer. And I don't know if I'll have time. It's certainly in the notes, um, uh, in lecture four in the notes. Um, you can define a complex. It's actually not the best point of view. Better to think of these as morphism classes. That's the way it generalizes to other cohomology theories. Yeah, so Roman. If G is GLN, C, have you run into the Riemann Hilbert problem? Like, no, I mean, if G is GLN, and I'm trying um, to understand the. 
Where, 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 where? No, no, I mean, everywhere. No, I, no, no. <laughs> I, I, GLN is not uh, abelian. Right, right, right. No, no, I'm just asking, like, if you, do, if you try to replace, for example, yeah. and try to re like learn the topology of classical bundle from the holonomies, Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. So, yeah, good. So, you're asking about this theorem here. Right. Notice I said G is compact. Uh, GLNC is not compact. And most definitely there are, in the notes I give you a reference where somebody wrote a paper explaining uh, counterexamples to this statement when G is non-compact. And uh, I think that's an excellent point. He didn't, that paper does not mention the Riemann-Hilbert problem, as far as I can tell. As far, as far as I remember, but I think that's a nice point. That's a nice point. That's an easy way to see that this, this theorem is false when G is not compact. Okay, I think we should stop here. We have our dinner at the WeatherTech Cafe at C4C at 6, not too long from now. So let's thank Greg again. We'll see you soon. <laughs>